pai. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou e hui hui mai nei, e hono hono mai nei, <coughs> i o koutou tini wā kainga, uh, puta mō te motu, o tira, puta mō te ao. Uh, Nau mai hari mai ki tēnā e hui hui ngā o tātou, uh, e ki a nei ko te tikanga rangahau webinar series. Uh, ko tēnei kaupapa i, I puta mai i raro i te mana i te manaakitanga o te matapuninga o te kotahi. Uh, nā reira ngā mai, haere mai, whakatau mai ki tēnei hui hui ngā o tātou. Hi uri tēnei no uh, roto o muri whenua, uh, ko ngā tikahu ko te raro a ngā iwi, ko te uri o hina, ko ngā tohi a ngā nā hapu, ko jiri o tīpine tōku ingoa. <coughs> ko rero māku te honore, <laughs> ki te pohiri atu, ki te rahiri atu, ki tō, tō tātou nei pū kōrero mō tēnei rā, ki a Jenny Lee Morgan. Uh, nō reira Jenny, nā mai, hara mai, kia ora mai. Uh, o te rā tēnā tātou katoa. <coughs> um, I'd like to extend warm greetings to everybody who's joined us today uh, for this, the third in the series of four uh, Tika Narangaho webinar. Um, I'd like to welcome all the students, the my Tikupina students, uh, fellow researchers and scholars uh, who are interested in this series of Kaupapa. Um, thanks for joining us today. I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. We're fortunate today to have Associate Professor Jenny Lee Morgan uh, presenting her Kaupapa Purako as methodology, and we very much look forward to hearing from Jenny. Before we do that, though, I just need to acknowledge the sponsors and um, uh, collaborators on the series, and that is Mai Te Kupinga, mm -hmm. uh, Nga Pai o Te Maramatanga, Te Matapuninga o Te Kotahi, Ako Aotearoa, and of course our hosts, uh, Te Rai Matatini, Nga uh, Mihinui Kia Koto Katoa. Uh, just a little bit about Jenny. <laughs> so Jenny Lee Morgan um, has extensive experience and expertise in Māori education. Uh, she is formerly the head of school of Te Puna Wānanga, the University of Auckland, and she is currently the deputy director of Kotahi Research Institute, which um, also we refer to as Te Matapuninga o Te Kotahi. Um, pertinent to today's presentation, Jenny's doctoral thesis entitled Ako, Purako of Māori Secondary School Teachers back in 2008 uh, was seminal in the development of Purako as a Kopapa Māori approach to na narrative inquiry and sparked her investigation into Purako as Indigenous story work. So we really look forward to hearing more from Jenny. Um, but before she gets into her presentation, I thought we'd just set a little bit of contextual ground by asking you, Jenny, um, how did you begin developing this uh, Purako as methodology? Mm -hmm. Just would you like to talk about that a little bit? Mm -hmm. Settle our nerves <laughs> and we'll move into the presentation. Okay, tēnā yeah. koe, Jenny. Hoi anō ki a koutou katoa, tēnā koutou. Koutou te rau matatini, uh, nā koutou i, I whakarite, i whakatau mai, uh, i a mātou, i a, mm. I a maira, a tēnā koutou. Kia ora everyone. Um, thank you, Gillian, for that question. And I think it's really important to begin this call around uh, my involvement, if you like, in Pūrāko as methodology, because I don't claim to be a Pūrāko expert uh, by any means. And I think the story of how I came to be in this space and how it developed as methodology is important in particular for those students and others developing their own methodologies under the mantle of Kaupapa Māori. So I think there are three key things in terms of my development of uh, Pūrāko as a methodology. The first, and it really links to Leone and Linda's prior uh, kōruro in these webinars, which were, was around uh, contributing to Kaupapa Māori theory and Kaupapa Māori research. And so when I began my a doctoral thesis at the University of Auckland in the uh, early 1990s, Linda uh, Smith, Graham Smith, uh, Leone, Kuni Jenkins, 
um, uh, Margie, Trish, a number of people were uh, making that space around Kaupapa Māori and arguing for Kaupapa Māori in the academy and done a fabulous job around um, developing Kaupapa Māori theory. And it was really uh, a challenge to us and following in those footsteps, and Leonie was one of my supervisors, how are you going to extend Kaupapa Māori theory? If you are going to say you are um, using kind of Māori theory, what is it beyond a chapter in your thesis, as Leonie would say? What is it beyond uh, doing this theoretical groundwork of Kaupapa Māori theory and then turning to, um, reverting back to Western methods? Not that they said there was anything wrong with that, but there was a real a challenge to think about what did we contribute to Kaupapa Māori? And I think in particular to um, Leonie's corridor in the webinar about our right to claim knowledge and that challenge for us to enact uh, through methodology, through research, Kaupapa Māori. Um, I also reflect on what Linda said about um, the importance of agency in research. And it was very clear to us from the beginning in uh, those early years around the power of research. And a number of Māori academics uh, in those early years, Kathy Berman, Ngahuya uh, Tewe Kōtsuku, and others were, were very um, overt in talking about the power of research and the, the significance of research to redistribute resources to um, frame things differently, etc. So, you know, I was really encouraged, if you like, by, uh, by those people at that time to think about what does it mean to enact Kaipapa Māori in my research. And I just came out of my master's uh, work, and my master's work had looked at um, Māori Chinese, being Māori Chinese, and how that was um, significant in schooling. So how did, what did it mean to be Māori Chinese and how did schools manage our identity, if you like? Uh, and I'd used oral history method there. And so I sort of dabbled in narrative inquiry and I had come to see that there were some really big gaps in that method. Uh, and, and I think back to an uh, interview that I did with my father at the time. So I'd gone to my dad and I'd said, Dad, I'm thinking about doing my master's thesis about Māori Chinese and, and Māori Chinese experiences in schooling. And I remember being at a cafe and my dad said, uh, wow, that's, you know, that's really great. And he just launched into this very powerful story about being Māori Chinese and how a number of things that happened to him at school that had a huge impact on how he saw himself, whether he joined Kapahaka, whether he was in the margins, how he saw himself in Chinese gardens, and uh, some very painful stories. And I, and in that exchange, there was lots of learning and reflection for me. And in the process of writing those stories up, using an oral history method, I found that the stories really fell flat that it didn't encapsulate that way you are, that mamai, the things that weren't said, the things that were in the body language, uh, through the words. If we're just looking at words, then there's a whole lot of things that are unsaid. So it started me thinking when I came to my doctoral thesis about how do I start to um, ensure that those things are there in a story that uh, are there when we're talking to each other. So that was one of the reasons I came to came to think about Pūrāko. Um, the other reason, and so if I, if I turn now to my doctoral study, which was about Ako, I was interested in the pedagogy of Māori teachers, and I was a, a Māori secondary school teacher at the time, and I could see that in our schools, Māori teachers were doing and had done for many years amazing work, being critical 
in large secondary schools to Māori learners and their whānau. And there was a real shift in the, the mainstream dominant literature discourse around uh, the importance of teachers and a shift to looking at the sort of evidence-based approach. And one of the uh, one of the dominant discourses at the time, and it still is, is this focus on effective teaching. And I'm and I'm not saying that effective teaching literature is not important, but it was. Uh, it's not the only way of thinking about what teachers do. And so I was, and what was happening, and the best evidence since this series had begun in, in New Zealand with uh, the Ministry of Education in 2003, beginning the Best Evidence series, which really, um, if we look back at where the best evidence or evidence-based research comes from, it was following in uh, a movement in education that had come from overseas in the US and the UK that had really come out of the biomedical uh, model. And there was a, a real focus on what was evidence and a very narrow focus at that point on uh, large, usually quantitative, um, you know, yeah, large scale um, randomised research. Not that the Ministry of Education, to their credit, did that here. Uh, the Ministry of Education New Zealand's idea of best evidence was much broader than that. However, it was still narrow, if you like, and um, in terms of capable Māori thinking about what is evidence. And so I wanted to uh, push back against that and, and thinking about what is our call and what do Māori teachers do, it wasn't as easy as saying, here's a list of 10 things. Mm -hmm. And if you go away and do those 10 things, uh, you will be yeah, an effective teach. teacher. And I really wanted to think about how Māori teachers uh, sourced who they are and what they're doing. And that wasn't easy to capture. And so, again, Purako came up as a, as a way to do that. So I said I, there were three key things. So the first was around Kaupapa Māori, trying to you know, develop and extend and contribute to Kaupapa Māori. The second was pushing back against uh, this, this evidence-based discourse that really was and continues to be focused on outcomes. Uh, and the third, really was the cope of Ako. I never really would have looked at Purako if it wasn't for Ako. And my topic was about Ako. My interest was thinking about what is Māori pedagogy and how do Māori teachers enact Māori pedagogy for Ako to, um, to meet the needs of learners and their whānau. And I think if you are going to look at a Māori concept or theory or value or practice like a call then Māori methodologies really do come to the fore and if you look at uh, indigenous literature you know that's echoed time and time again so uh, I was trying to flesh out what was a call and Purāka as a pedagogy uh, really connected with a call at that time so my coming to Purāko as a methodology came via that, uh, that pathway, if you like. So are you going to talk about more, more about the nuts and bolts of our call in your presentation? Because there may be some of you as that mm -hmm. has um, much a term that they're very conversant with. Or the, um, the I think that might you. come up, but we can come back to it if people want to talk more about and it. And I say that because I mentioned questions because I forgot to mention that um, if you haven't already, to the viewers, if you haven't already registered for this webinar, please go ahead and do so. It just allows us to see who's joining us and um, from where and, and, and those sort of things. Um, also, if you have questions that come up during the webinar, please um, send them either to by email, by email, if you, you'll see that when you register, there'll be a facility for you to send it by email. Otherwise, just add it to the live chat and we'll try to address them as we go, as they're relevant, or else we'll have a 
for sure have a question and answer session mm -hmm. toward the end where we can address some of those questions. It was my realising that I'd forgotten to do that, that they asked a question. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so, are you ready, Jen, to go into your presentation? Mm -hmm. Should we do that? Okay, kill sure. So if we go to the first uh, PowerPoint. I've just, um, on this PowerPoint, you'll see Joanne Archie Ball's name and a reference to her uh, book, Indigenous Story Work, Educating the Heart, Mind, Body and Spirit. And Joanne was really a leader in this Indigenous Story Work movement. Uh, and, and her work really encouraged me to explore Prudakwa's methodology. And I think Linda and Leone both talk about uh, our relationships to our Indigenous uh, whanaunga who are doing similar work and really gathering strength from what they're doing. And I want to acknowledge Joanne here because uh, it was her work that helped me think more about Prudakwa's methodology. I think, um, and so I've made reference to a story she has in her book called Coyote Searching for the Bone Needle. And those of you who have just attended our wānanga, Te Kangaranga Ho Wānanga, uh, will be familiar with the story, but encourage others to go to the book and read it. And it's a very powerful story. Uh, and without giving it away, because I do encourage you to go and read it. It was really pivotal for Joanne in thinking about uh, the connection between Indigenous theory and Indigenous methodology. Uh, and similarly, as I've said just uh, previously, that um, that was really pivotal for me too. And thinking about alcohol and what was the methodology to use, what was the appropriate methodology to uh, to use in, in relation to that study. Um, so, Joanne's, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just thinking about, we just talk about this, this story a little bit more to, uh, perhaps I'll just talk about, I won't talk about the story, but I'll talk to the point of the story and her work, which brings me to the point I want to make, and that is the need to do some real decolonization around the methodologies we want to use, uh, even if they are our traditional methodologies. And so part of what the story Coyote Searching for the Bone Needle does is it directs us to think more about what are those methodologies, our traditional methodologies, that are much harder sometimes to utilise because of the academy, because of what's considered scholarship, because of what uh, the dominant discourses say about evidence, but are appropriate for us in terms of our work. Uh, and similarly, um, you know, I thought many times when I was doing my doctoral thesis, should I do Pudako? Because at that point in time, no one was using it in terms of a, a, a method or methodology. So Pudako absolutely had been used in a number of um, fields. And I talk about that in my doctoral thesis. But in terms of methodology, it hadn't quite got there yet. And, you know, over the years, because it took me many years to do my thesis, I sort of thought, oh, why don't I do case study? You know, why don't I do something that was already done and easy to do? But I think um, Joanne's story here, Coyote Searching for the Bone Needle, uh, helped me think about, you know, really going to those places that were difficult, but more relevant and more appropriate for us. Uh, Joanne's work, this book hadn't come out at the time I did my um, thesis, but her PhD thesis was really um, instrumental in my thinking. So if we go to the next slide. I just want to touch briefly and on something Marie Batiste said that echoes what uh, Leone and Linda have said about the importance of scholarship and the agenda of Indigenous scholarship in Marie's words, which is to transform Eurocentric theory so that it will not only include and properly value Indigenous knowledge, 
thought and heritage at all levels for education, curriculum and professional practice, but also develop a cooperative and dignified strategy that will invigorate and animate Indigenous language, cultures, knowledge and vision in academic structures. I thought this was really critical because it didn't just push us to use Pūrāko as a methodology or method to collect the things that we might normally collect. And Linda makes this point really strongly in the last webinar that if we are, that Kaupapa Māori reframes everything about the research space, not just the methodology, if you like, but the question, the, um, the need to be transformative, uh, the need to exercise agency, uh, the political nature of Kaupapa Māori research. And I, so I just wanted to um, include Marie's quote here, because I think that last part of the quote that asks us to remember the point of our scholarship. So it's not just ma about making academic room, if you like, or space in the academy. It's actually to do research that makes a difference. And, and she's referred to animate Indigenous language, cultures, knowledge, and vision. So it's, it's a large agenda. Next slide. So in, in the development of Pūrāko as decolonising method, methodology, it was really important for me to think about how do we understand Pūrāko now? What happened to our Pūrāko uh, over the years? And we began by talking about how I got into Pūrāko because it wasn't a linear development. It wasn't that one day I, I read a Pūrāko and thought, oh, this is wonderful, I'm going to use it as methodology. Uh, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. It, it exists in the, um, within, you know, this this whole space of how our stories are being told. And Ani Nakaidi's work, her master's thesis, and in particular, uh, was really critical in my thinking about the way that Pūrāko were. Uh, documented, were captured in those early years by those ethno ethnographers, anthropologists, uh, and our stories were changed and transformed to, um, uh, you know, disrupt our ways of seeing the world. And uh, and Ani talks about the devastating impact, and you can see in her title of her uh, thesis, The Balance Destroyed, and she talks in particular around the gender relations uh, and her second book, or her, her book rather, Colonising Myths and Mighty Realities, um, takes that further. And of course, her PhD thesis, which um, is a, again built on that work. So, some of the things in terms of decolonising Pūrāko was to understand that those Pūrāko that many of those Pūrāko that were recorded in those early years were not only recorded by white. Pākehā men, but they sought uh, stories from men. There were uh, uh, there was an exclusion a lot of the time of women. That idea that women couldn't possibly hold mātauranga or knowledge, and that uh, you know that the men held that information. So there is uh, a domination of these stories told by men. That the stories collected at that time were. Uh, very much hybrid stories, or we they were collected, were hybridised, yeah. that's right, yeah, so, you know, this idea of going to um, one iwi and, and asking about a Māori story, for instance, and then going somewhere else, another iwi, and having those stories or different versions um, emerge didn't sit well with, you know, those Pākehā researchers at the time, and so there was a very uh, deliberate uh, attempt to hybridise the stories, and in fact, in um, you know some of those collections of Māori myths and legends, in the preface or introduction, they will say that these are hybridised stories, because there was a, a it, it needed to fit within that Western view of what is a story. There's a beginning, middle, and end. There is a the story. There is a truth, if you like, uh, and 
is it says on the um, PowerPoint, you know, they were commodified for consumption. What's the easiest thing to consume? And they were uh, purged for purity. That is all sanitized. Yeah, yeah. sanitized. Uh, any uh, reference uh, to sex, to anything that was uh, remotely considered not Christian. Um, had to be taken out and so you know there are lots of versions of our stories and one of the things that we we need to do in our Puraka is uh, reclaim our versions of those stories yeah. so that was a really important part of thinking about how Puraka were constructed and moving them from Puraka as just myths and legends to Puraka as critical stories for us to see the world and understand who we are and how we engage in the world Burako, uh, I think it, this is a great quote by Medita Mita, who the late Medita Mita, who um, was a pioneering Māori woman in uh, television and, and the movies and uh, film talked about the way our stories were changed and transformed to become fantasy and myth. So I'll just let you read that for a second. So Medita recognised the way in which not only the stories were uh, transformed, but the power of storytelling. And so I, I think it's just an important, important to remember the way stories are framed, um, the importance of story, the importance of the way we tell a story, what we focus on, uh, and to understand that we need to uh, we criti critically think about the way our stories have been produced in the past. If we go to the next slide, I just want to talk a little bit about um, the, the theorization of Puraka. So moving from this development methodology, and I'm, I'm really spending quite a lot of time talking about the development because I think for those of you out there who are thinking about uh, Kaupapa Māori methodologies, and wanting to, um, you know, uh, contribute to Kaupapa Māori and create and extend your own methodologies, this is an example. Purako isn't here because it's the only method or methodology, it's here to, as an example of a way a methodology can be developed. So one of the first things I talked about was the decolonisation of our idea of what Purako is, and the second is uh, theorising to Pūterāko or Pūrāko and uh, it's been wonderful over the years to have had wānanga with groups of uh, people about you know what does Pūrāko tell us the word Pūrāko the memory of this word tell us about how important Pūrāko were in our lives and it's no coincidence that Pūrāko, the word Pūrāko, is the word for story in our world. Uh, and so people have a whole lot of ways of thinking about Pūrāko. What does Pūrāko mean? I've put here the Pūrāko is one way of thinking about it. And, and this really came from my work um, and my discussions with uh, Professor Wedema Doherty and we were writing our doctoral theses at the same time, mm -hmm. as we engaged in lots of great corridor. And he is someone uh, who has grown up in, in the bush, in the Nahiri, and talked to me a lot about Rako. And so if we think about the pū o te rāko, and I've just got that little diagram there to remind us, uh, the, the pū is like the origin or the foundation, if you think about that word pū, how it's used in our language, te pū manawa, te pū waha, te pū take, uh, what's the mother's doing? Te pū kōrero. Te pū is like the main key, origin, the foundation. So I would, looking at that 
picture. I think that that Pudaka was that trunk and those roots, that really strong part of the Rako that really draws in other nutrients and allows that tree to grow. Te Pū o te Rako. Uh, the Rako, of course, is not only a tree, but there are many uh, uses of Rako. There are many types of Rako, and reminded about that. Um, the importance of Rako at the Wānanga last week when Paul de Sharples was here and we were talking about um, Mau Rāko, Vayaha, Mau Rāko. And so, uh, yes, yeah, so Te Pua Te Rāko. Te Pua Te Rāko helped me think about and theorise Pua Rāko in order to think more deeply about methodology. So, if we see ourselves as trees, and this is, I suppose, um, starting to think about how we, uh, you know, use Purāko as methodology, you know, Kotatangaraako, it's not a metaphor. Trees are not a metaphor for us. We are the trees. Tane Mahuta, Tane Pukapiri. Then, how to Purāko? enable us as trees to grow. How important are stories? Mm. How important are these stories of our world in terms of us growing, in terms of us thriving uh, and nurturing other trees? So you start to think more deeply about how critical Pūrāko are. Pūrāko are not just stories. They're not just myths and legends, fiction, fantasy, fables, vignettes, uh, but they're really critical to our understanding of the world. They are te pū o te rāko. So, and I've just included the next slide. And where they're rooted. Where yeah. are they rooted in? Yeah. Of, uh, of te ngāhere mm -hmm. as a reminder of where the Pūrāko live. So if we think about our Māori uh, Rāko, and, and Ngāhere again gives us um, a clue about how we understand our story. So Ngāhere being Ngā being the, Here being binds, is the things that bind us together. And if you look at our bush, our, our trees live together. They're all connected. They actually don't grow very well by themselves. Mm -hmm. They need each other to grow. So the Pua Te Rāko sits amongst and thrives within other Rāko. Mm -hmm. So I've been thinking about trees as I drove down uh, from Tāmaki to um, Waikato uh, this, this morning and was looking at all the uh, non-native trees and mm -hmm. thinking about <laughs> Who planted those trees and why are they there and, and why are they in that straight line? And, um, you know, I think that those are really good uh, things to reflect on and thinking about Pūrāko. Mm -hmm. Who planted that Pūrāko? Why is it there? Who planted that story? Who, who um, is trying to grow this new story, if you like? Where are our native Rāko in relation to these why were why did one of the first things that colonization do actually cut down all our bush and plant uh you know Roses. rearrange that's right <laughs> rearrange our terrain and our landscape mm -hmm. and that you know um Purako are really um you know the stories of our land the stories in our land so um, Pūrāka have real, and, and you know, lots of people have talked about the theory of Pūrāko from that word Pūrāko in really complex and um, exciting ways. And I've just begun a, a research project on Pūrāko. We've been talking to a number of Meki uh, Komatsu and people using Pūrāko and the number of meanings that are brought to Pūrāko and how they uh, are used is just um, really diverse and ex extremely complex and multiple. 
So I should have said for those people who have come to our webinar thinking, oh gosh, you know, it's great, I'm going to listen to this this uh, Pudako webinar and be able to go off and use Pudako really quickly, maybe a little bit disappointed because I, I think, you know, partly what I want to do is scope the methodology, provide a scope of what Pudako is. And, and Linda said in her last webinar, Kaupapa Māori uh, researchers often want to say, how do you do it? How do you do Kaupapa Māori? How do you do Pūrāko? Give me the 10 things so I can go and do a Pūrāko, mm -hmm. use Pūrāko method. Mm -hmm. And ours is really to get you to think more about the why. And I think uh, that's what I'm trying to, you know, just emphasise a little bit here. And people are going to find it frustrating, like, when is you going to get to the, well, what do I do? Uh, and so I want, and, and that's part of Pūrāko is pedagogy, you know, the, the, they're thinking more deeply about what Pūrāko is, uh, how does it work, how to listen to stories, how to tell stories, how to think about our stories. Um, yeah. Okay. So, next slide. So I am going to talk very briefly about some of the things I think if you are to use Pudako as a methodology and or method, uh, that some of the things that you might think about. And these really come from thinking about Pudako and its fullness into the research context. Uh, so I've just got four things, but there are have as, as points to emphasise at this point, but of course there are many more. The first is just about the portrayal of Pūrāko, and I've just put the re in front of everything to just remind us that just to keep decolonising and be thinking critically about things. Uh, yeah, so re-presenting Pūrāko as pedagogy. So the first in the title, there's that really clear act of Pūrāko being pedagogical, the teaching and learning element of Pūrāko, that Pūrāko in the delivery of stories is an acting ako, that is teaching and learning, and in the listening and in the reflecting. So the first point, re-portraying Pūrāko, is about uh, the, the importance of the portrayal, the, the importance for the storyteller to be creative, to be engaging, to be connecting with audience in a way that uh, sparks interest, you know, that ignites uh, a desire um, to listen, to learn. Uh, and often, when I've done Pūrāko uh, sessions with students, they really find their voice. That's a really, can be a really invigorating um, experience because, you know, we all have Pūrāko. We all, our Pūrāko aren't those of, those ones of Nehera, only those ones of Nehera, but they are our contemporary Pūrāko because if Pūrāko, we understand them as enabling that tree to grow. They, they are based on those Pūrāko from Onehera, those Pūrāko of our ancestors and our Pūrāko of today. So our, our portrayal is all important because if they do not connect with our audiences of today and our kids are watching YouTube and doing things very quickly, uh, we have to think creatively into that space. How do we continue to portray our Pūrāko in engaging ways? So I encourage us to, to uh, not get stuck in a particular way of thinking that Pūrāko has to be delivered, but that there are pedagogical elements that Pūrāko need to hold to and that uh, it is a challenge of those delivering those Pūrāko to portray those Pūrāko in ways that are engaging and fit for that audience. Um, the second point, recreating Pūrāko is political. Pūrāk, this, this element draws on uh, 
the ethical, if you like, considerations of Purako. That is thinking more deeply into whose Purako is it? Uh, how do I, um, what is the accountability back to that Purako teller? Whose story have I engaged? Who does it belong to? Am I the person to tell this Purako? Uh, what right have I got to tell this Purako? Uh, and to think about the ethics. Uh, and Linda talked about a lot about that in, in the last webinar, that, that those ethics are always um, um, present in, as a kaupapa Māori researcher. Uh, who's, you know, and I'm thinking about a research project I'm involved in at the moment, at the moment and there are a number of prūrāko at this one marae. And those prūrāko are all quite different, but they're the same, they're the same story. They belong to the story of a marae. Mm -hmm. So how do we... Um, how do we uh, negotiate those pūrāko and the way they're told uh, with each other? One of the things that I think pūrāko offers is a transparency around the story that's been told and your um, ability and your responsibility to retell that pūrāko in a way that fits the audience, but is true to the messages that are held there. Mm -hmm. As opposed to often a narrative inquiry, we see, you know, we, we're co-constructing the, the story and we're checking in with the person and we give them back their transcript and they sign it off and now we're power sharing. Uh, and I don't think it's quite as simple as that. Mm -hmm. And when we as researchers know we are shaping those stories for a particular purpose and other um, Māori researchers have written that, about that in the past. So Prudaka has a transparency about it that says actually you are adding another branch to the Rako and it's your responsibility to add that branch and to grow this tree in a way that continues to transform. You don't necessarily have to keep it exactly as it was told to you if that story is not going to work in the next context. So I think um, there's some political things that are, are raised there. Uh, retelling Kurako's provocation speaks to this notion that uh, our stories aren't, don't fit to this beginning, middle and end like necessarily uh, like Western stories do. That in fact, when I first started thinking about Kurako, one uh, kaumatua said to me, in terms of ako, it's really important that Purako feed the person enough for them not to be full, but enough to come back to want to eat more, to give them the sort of delicious taste, you know, that they want more. Like my kids like chocolate, you know, that's can't wait till the next opportunity to eat chocolate. <laughs> so how do you provoke a response? Uh, Keeps them engaged. That keeps them engaged, but wanting to learn more. So Purako um, should provoke, should provoke a response, should provoke a response, uh, and maybe intellectually, mm -hmm. it may be emotionally, it may be spiritually, it may be physically. People laugh, they cry, uh, and that provocation might not be there and then. And this is one of the things that you know tries to speak back to the evidence based. Um, discourse is that ako, teaching and learning, purako, isn't sort of input in and then output in straight away, that you can't measure that output often quickly, that it might be five years or ten years later. So um, purako's provocation. And then uh, that last one is restoring purako is powerful, is really recognising how important our stories are and claiming those stories to be important, claiming our, our language, our, um, our stories as valid, our stories as evidence, uh, our word is important. And I think we've got used to this environment where everything's written in contracts now, and if I don't sign it, or if I don't write it in a book, therefore it's not important, or this hasn't been written before, so therefore it's not valid. You know, coming back to those things that we know, um, and really listening, learning to listen, uh, learning to learn, or learning to tell our stories in ways that our tūpuna always envisaged them to be told. 
I know I've been talking for a long time. Yeah, yeah. So good. I think that's our time going. We've done this for a long time. Because you've done this for I've only got a couple more slides, so shall yeah, I just... I think so. I don't see any feedback for the question, so we'll carry on. So if we go to the next slide then, uh, I just wanted to acknowledge um, the, the fabulous work that's been done in Purarco methodology and method. Uh, and I've just got some examples of uh, students who have um, been working in Purarco. Um, Jolie Sipi Hama, or Wai Boiwa, which is a really exciting uh, work, and she's just finished her doctoral thesis, Kia ora John Lee, uh, using Purako to, um, to research six generations mm -hmm. of her whanau and look at the importance of naming. And, and uh, I think I'm really excited. Uh, about her work, as I am at Hayley Cavino's work towards a method of belonging, contextualising gender violence in Māori worlds. Um, Hayley's work is very powerful. It's about uh, really about using Prudaka's healing, and uh, it's a very brave piece of work. And I encourage uh, you know people who are interested in Prudaka. Quite, and these ones that I've got here are quite different, um, and. Yeah, so fabulous piece of work, uh, Hayley. Tanya Cliff, who, who these are two master's theses, um, looking at those students with high and complex needs, and Tanya's from Te Arawa, and uh, quite a strong uh, Te Arawa Pūrāko coming through her work, and her stories of her students, and Barbara Hawati Pūrāko, Māori Leadership in Mainstream Schools. Barbara's uh, from... Ngāti Kine and uh, currently a secondary school teacher and yeah so and of course Carwin's work, Carwin Jones, um, he's a lawyer and used Prudaka as a way to um, think more deeply about uh, legal systems and Māori legal systems and so some really you know, exciting work to be done uh, that's being done in Pudaka, and of course, there are many more. But just to put those up there for people who are interested uh, mm -hmm. and who want to look at um, some examples if you're doing your master's or PhD thesis at the moment. And so, I thought Gillian might be good to just have a to come to you and talk about your experience um, in Pudaka or uh, the work that you've been doing. Yeah, okay. Um, so initially I was reading that question because I was thinking, well, geez, you know. Um, but as I'm hearing you talk, it's becoming more and more and more relevant to some of the work that I'm doing. So um, I particularly love that um, graphic image of the Rako uh, connected and, you know, um, the transformation that takes place as a tree grows and the idea of not being uh, isolated. But you know, being um, at its best when it's surrounded by other rako. And I was also thinking about, so we right back to Kohanga, we used to have this little um, wayata that we did with the tamariki, I can't quite remember it all, but it started off, te du, te mori, te we. And, and mm -hmm. it was all about that, this, the, the kākam, te timatanga o te, o te rako. Um, lots of things. Uh, you were talking about representation and I have a past as a well past and present as a translator and so um, I think that's really important the idea of who's telling the story uh, how it's being represented and by whom and when you're talking about how uh, Puraka have been or for a start written down and how that changes them and in that writing down being uh, sanitized, being uh, you know hybridized, so that it becomes what the next generation understand as a a truth or a guide mm -hmm. from our tupuna that isn't quite doesn't quite have the integrity of which it was intended to have. Um, so all those things are coming up for me. Um, 
question of the plain number. Right? So we were um, talking about how those people would use Pudarco, mm -hmm. and perhaps you have used a Pudarco in your work, and oh, yeah. you're just sharing yeah. how that's been. And yeah, that, that track that I've done. Like, um, so also, oh, I, I know what I just wanted to talk about when you talked about um, you know things like sex and. Um, anything that was considered non-Christian, not being mm -hmm. acceptable and being erased. Mm -hmm. So predominantly the work that I'm doing at the moment is looking at um, what we're calling Māpūrama Māori um, representations of sexuality. And why that's important is because we want rangatahi who are um, needing to know, have information around how to uh, be strong in the world, how to be safe in the world, how to um, negotiate that pathway to uh, living their, you know, true gender identity and their sexual identity. Um, we want them to have um, ideas that are, or information that's coming from a Māthirunga Māori base as opposed to Western uh, representations of that, which, you know, in the sexuality education area tend to be focused on things like consent, so you know, sexual violence, you know, focus on uh, the dis-ease mm -hmm. around sexuality, um, which we don't think is a really uh, healthy way to look at it. We have much more beautiful representations of sexuality, hard to find. So what you were talking about makes my job quite hard. Uh, it's hard to find those fragments of Mātūrama um, Māori, of Pūrāko, that still use the words mm -hmm. that we make them searchable for a start, but also make them relevant. So um, I know Timothy Karetsu talks about one particular passage where um, it talks about a young man uh, who was killed in a battle and um, that young man who was um, sexual with, with this woman and that man. Mm -hmm. So that gives us a clue into how our tūpuna looked at diverse sexuality. Mm -hmm. uh, it was an everyday normality, it wasn't um, stigmatised, it wasn't denigrated. So that's some really great information for our anatahi to have. But in the representation of that um, particular part of our waiata uh, in, in this uh, book that it was found in, they had changed aitia, which is sexual, mm -hmm. to afitia, which is embrace. So, I mean, I suppose it's, well, it's it's a watering down of mm -hmm. the original intention. Right. So, yeah, it's making it more palatable, I guess, from a from an English Christian perspective. So, yeah, it's, um, for me, it's encouraging to know that there are these fragments and, and they're worth seeking out but there's an awful lot that's been lost or erased mm. and it's um, and I, I think you know you raise this idea that Pūrāko can exist and should exist along our, aside our other methodologies that is more te te, mm. um, mm. um I know Naomi Simmons PhD thesis and she also also used Pūrāko but she also used Wānana and I think there's real exciting potential of bringing those things together because they don't exist by themselves and in fact as I said Prudako came out of the engagement with Ako and if we look back to um, Rangimari Pere's work around Ako, remember Te Whiki, mm -hmm. and it had a whole range of uh, concepts, practices, uh, principles that made up Ako, so too I think we make up Prudako yes. if you like, so Prudako and I don't see them as, um, you know, neat, tidy little packages that are separate from more their dear whakatauki and those things, although they're different, so that they uh, actually work together. So when you are hearing someone tell a purāko, they might break into more their dear, or they might begin, or they might do a whole range of things. So I think, you know, for those of you who are looking at purāko, uh, you don't have to be limited by that approach, you know, like I can't look at whakatauki or I can't bring in these things. It is about how we... I see them almost as part of the same. Mm -hmm. More tia tia tells a story. Oh. Um, yeah, I, I don't see that, that big a difference between Pudapa and, mm. and a lot of those, uh, those writings that have been left to us. 
Can I go to question and answer? Okay. All right. How does Puraka as a methodology compare with Joseph Campbell's Mong mm -hmm. myth and his theses in the hero's journey? Yeah, I'm not really familiar with Joseph Campbell's work, so I'm not, not, not sure if I can answer that question. Um, yes, let's not answer okay, the question right. in case I make a big mess of it. I, I vaguely know it, but I don't want to. Um, do okay. that in case I get it completely wrong. How do I manage the referencing requirements? and cite sources for this me methodological approach? Uh, how do I manage referencing requirements and cite sources? Um, Most Pudako are referenceable and yes. otherwise you're interviewing yeah. someone or yeah. capturing a story. That's right. Yeah. So yeah, you would either be, I would envisage using a Pudako that you've, you've read and want to uh, reference that, or you are referencing a Pudako that is being told to you, mm. and you can do those um, through personal communication. Yep. You can do that uh, in terms of your own interviewing and becoming part of the, the, the study itself. So, uh, or you know, if it's uh, on the web, I mean, I just think it's uh, just the usual ways we would reference someone speaking. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ana, me pehe te whakatau naki, oh, aroha mai, me pehe e whakatau naki ai te kaupaparangahau o te pūrāko kia aroha, arohia, kia arohia e ngā whariwananga o te motu, huri nō te ao. Mm. Um, o te imata pia, te rā horonga, te rā toronga mm. o tō, o tō, yeah, I think so. I think, you know, what, what we're arguing is that Pūrāko is, is uh, evidence mm. that Pūrāko offer a way of um, uh, humanising, if you like, a lot of our, uh, all, uh, our issues particularly our contemporary issues, um, they complexify, they t tell about the multiple levels of experience in Pūrāko, uh, in, in people's experiences. Uh, and I think the more people use Pūrāko in various ways, the more space that's created. Um, and I, I think we, yeah, that's why it's important to use our language, you know, and it came up in Linda and uh, Leonie's called it all about, holding on to saying it's a Pūrāko. And I think actually one of the um, slides that I had coming up next, which you could just put on as an example, uh, um, Kia ora te reo, which is just a publication from Te Tauru Whiri, Te Kohinga Pūrāko, and it's a contemporary poet Pūrāko for young children in little sort of comic boxes. And I was interested that I mean, of course, Pūrāka has been used for many years, but the more we um, talk about it as Pūrāka, uh, I think it, it just makes those spaces in the academy, and we keep pushing those boundaries of what it is and how we talk about it uh, and how we employ it. I don't know if that answers the question. I think so. Um, I was just thinking how when I first began to learn Te Reo Māori and Pūrāka was presented to me as like a distinction between Pūrāko and Pākiwaitara. Mm -hmm. So Pākiwaitara more, more everyday kind of um, stories, maybe a bit more nāho, and then Pūrāko were more sort of deep, complex, mm -hmm. um, had that ako characteristic. And so I guess what I'm seeing here is a sort of blurring of the distinction. Yeah, I mean, in my um, discussions with people, there's definitely different views of what is Pūrāko, whether, whether Pūrāko and Paki are the same, some people think that they are, uh, some people think they're quite different, mm -hmm. and there is a, it seems to me, a, a, some people think, believe Pūrāko are those ones, uh, the more esoteric mm -hmm. Pūrāko, if you like, and some people think Pūrāko cover the gamut of 
those contemporary stories right through. So I was sort of interested in that um, kohinga pūrāko, the, the use of the term in that journal, because yes. I think it does speak to pūrāko being contemporary. Yes. But in that, that story, there are very strong learning, uh, teaching and learning messages. And in that case, around the language and how important the language is. So, mm -hmm. Okay, māwe te kaupako te pūrāko e kawe e kōrero, a kāmu te nōwa i te mana ki te whakakōrero i ngā pūrāko, well, it's a little bit like what we've just been talking about, mm -hmm. who has the mana, who has the mana to, uh, to make pūrāko, to bring them, to recover them, to retell them, to, I think we all do. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think, you know, our pūrāko, if we think about those ones uh, that are well-known, Rangi and Papa, you know, we all tell those pūrāko in ways that connect with us. And as children, our, our kids retell our pūrāko through pictures and through their own language and where they're at. And as we grow to understand uh, the depth of those pūrāko, we retell them uh, in ways that make sense for us. I think in the domain of research, if you're using Pudako to tell contemporary stories, then of course um, there is that negotiation with the original teller of the story and the um, very transparent way in which you want to craft this into a Pudako. So there is some, for instance, um, learning and, and we haven't got time probably to go into this in terms of the method, but learning to listen to a pūrāko. Because pūrāko is not all about the telling. Pūrāko is an ako, it's actually the listening that's really critical. How do you listen to a pūrāko? And even before that, how do you create the space in which the pūrāko can be told? What is the, the relationship that needs to be established for that pūrāko to be told? Because therein lies an important part of which pūrāko you are told. Are you ready for that pūrāko? Do, does, and, and Joanne um, Archibald talks a lot about, you know, having an open heart and our kaumātua and our elders knowing that the right time to tell that pūrāko. So a pūrāko methodology, and um, this is probably what I'm trying to speak to in, in terms of the scope, is, is huge. It's, it's thinking about you know, are you are you ready to hear the story when the person is, is wants to uh, share their experiences with you? Are you the one to take the story? And there's a lot of things going on in that space. Uh, who do you think you are as a researcher I to come and collect that story? Are you ready for that story? Are you going to be able to retell that story in a way that keeps the poo mm, uh, intact? Um, are you going to add something to that rāko. One of the things that I um, didn't get, didn't talk to in that picture of the ngāhere is that our pūrāko, in my view, need to be seen in relation to each other. That our pūrāko don't sit in isolation, just as a tree doesn't grow in isolation. That the real depth of learning in pūrāko is actually to the rel relationality between them. So if you listen to a number of pūrāko, at least that's in a contemporary setting, uh, about... Aye. Then... Aye, aye. So Ngahu Yatawe Kōtuku's book, Duahine, and the stories of women. You actually, when you read a number of them, you start to get a clearer, I think, you know, that you start to do the work as a listener uh, about what it means to be, for example, manawahine, I think. Uh, and, and similarly, and we talked about Moana Jackson's um, fabulous storytelling and, and how he use, utilises, I would say, contemporary pūrāko in his, often his speaking um, presentations. Mm -hmm. And he'll present pūrāko, well, three stories. He'll say, I'm telling three stories. And they all connect. So the depth of the pūrāko actually come through the connection. Mm -hmm. So, have we gone off that question? Um, well, the next one might be a little bit along those same lines. Kaha ngā tūkuna, mi ngā tika ngā hoki, o te kaupaparanga hau pūrāko mana mūtu hoki. Small question. 
ヒャハがつくな、目がつかな、ほきよって、かよぱらなはいくら、かいまなもちはげいえ。So, I think this speaks to,、um, coming back to the beginning, our agency to, and our right to reclaim our knowledge, s our right to say, this is our purako,、uh, to define our own methods and methodologies, to go back to thinking really carefully about. Um, our tikanga, our kawa, our vitina,、uh, our Māori, our Mātauranga, and thinking about Pūrāko in the context that we're in. And it's very difficult. It's like you know, talking about how to do kaupapa for Māori research, it's、sure. a bit like how to do Pūrāko. It, it is、um, going to be very context driven in terms of hapu and iwi, in terms of Um, our whenua and our connections to our whenua in terms of who's, you know, the audience, who's the listener, because a pūrāko can't exist without the listener.、Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can tell all the pūrāko you want, but if no one's listening to you, mō mō taima, you know, so if you want to speak to your child, for instance, you know, what are the、um, ways of doing that that hold that pūrāko intact for them? So,、uh, the, the methodology and the way we do、uh, use Pūrāko as research, I think,、uh, dependent on you know, the purpose of your research,、uh, the people that you are、uh, working with, and,、um, and, and you know, the, the Pūrāko itself, and, and what work you're wanting that Pūrāko to do. What, and, that, and that's not to say that those Pūrāko can't sit beside, and we talked about this earlier, Julian, other methods that, you know, may be quantitative or, you know, et cetera. So,、mm-hmm. they don't have to exist in isolation. Yeah. That's it for our questions. Did you want to go on with your next slide? Yeah, I've only got a couple more.、Um, The next slide was really just an example of、uh, their Pūrāko everywhere.、Uh, and this is a little piece from our local newspaper in, in Auckland,、uh, Paperboy, Fresh New Māori Stories on the Stage.、Uh, Te Pau Theatre, which is a new learner, is running a Kuanga series,、uh, Kuanga Festival. And you know, it's exciting to see. Pūrāko in a lot of domains, and actually, that was partly the development of Pūrāko for me in terms of research is that artists and playwrights and um, uh, writers were using Pūrāko and in their domains, whether it be in the legal domain and in terms of our land court, now Pūrāko were being told there and crafted in particular ways to suit that purpose.、Uh, And it was, and, you know, and that we should be developing Pūrāko in the domain of research as well. So, this,、uh, this was just to remind us that Pūrāko are everywhere. And really, to, as researchers, for us to shift or think really critically around the shift from Pūrāko in those general spheres to Pūrāko as research or as methodology, because I do think it's different.、Uh, and I do think there are some things we need to think. Really critically about and carefully about when we say we're going to use a Pūrāko methodology.、Uh, that last slide, this last slide is、uh, a photo of the mulching that、uh, my husband and my children did on the weekend. We've been trying to clear up our property and we have some, had some really tall trees that their branches need to be cut on, etc. And、uh, we had this huge pile of branches and leaves on our, on our、uh, section. And so my husband got the mulch and we mulched them. And、I've, I wanted to take a photo because I thought, actually, this is what happens to our, our pūdāko, should we not have a pū. Mm-hmm. Is that they actually just become mara mara? You know, there's all these sort of stories floating around, they don't land anywhere. They don't land anywhere for us to make a real、um, transformative difference, if you like. They do contribute, because I was thinking about mulch and you know, how we can, <laughs> <laughs> we can, they will be eventually compost and you know, grow the garden, but we could be growing 
you know, other trees, right? We talked about those exotic trees or non-native trees. So it's really easy for our, our Puraco, as we've talked about, to be fragmented, to be um, rewritten, to be reinterpreted, uh, if we cannot understand what is that te pū o te rākau. So trying to get us to think about pū rākau in that way, that they're not just stories, that they're really critical to our, our growing, our understanding of ourselves as Māori, they're critical to our um, development, our thriving, uh, our nurturing each other, and that as Leone says, when we're doing Kaipapa Māori research, we have to enact our pūrāko. And I think that, you know, even beyond research is a really important thing. And, and trying to, even in our household, trying to tell stories, you know, when we're all in a rush and the kids don't want to listen to us, mm -hmm. they want to look at the latest YouTube video about really slime or something. Really <laughs> we have to keep telling our stories. And the other day, um, we were driving along the Northwestern Motorway back to our house in Point Chevalier uh, and one of the kids asked about the mangroves and, and when you're driving on the motorway on the, on the, in the harbour uh, and so one of my sons said, well they, they were left by the Patupaire here and the Patupaire here is the story of Te Toka Roa which is the Miola Reef and uh, yeah, so these are these are puraka about that that landmark, and uh, you know even Te Rangi Matarau, which is a name for Point Chevalier. Our puraka are everywhere. Our puraka and our names are in our land. Um, it was lovely coming into Te Rangi Matatini um, workplace today, and all the all your spaces are named, mm -hmm. and uh, you know they each have their own uh, imbued with their own meanings and stories and so to to keep understanding that our stories are everywhere that each person has a story each whanau each hapu each iwi each all our land has, has been storied and to encourage us to keep wanting to read listen think recreate those stories uh, because i think that's the power of Pūrākai, that's what our tūpuna understood, always understood. Mm -hmm. How are we doing for time? Can I wrap up? Okay. Okay, Jenny, thank you so much for everything you've shared with us today. Thank you for not um, spoon-feeding us, giving us the 10 uh, little tick boxes by which we can become proficient uh, at using Pūrākai as a methodology, but giving us the poo from which to begin to develop our own ideas, uh, keep coming back to those basic um, guidelines that you've given us, um, the ethical guidelines, the, you know, the integrity, uh, the cautions, and also the courage, and the, actually the, not the impetus, what's the word? The imperative to nurture our puraco, to make them a part of our daily lives, as researchers, and um, and actually, arguably, for our whānau as well. Um, very rich. And, um, oh, I did want to ask you, actually, so, you know, you're talking about your dad telling you that very powerful pūrāko. Do we have time for this? <laughs> um, and, you know, as you're telling it, my eyes are welling up. And I'm thinking, so how do you represent, you're saying, you know, if you're not sitting there with him, if you were to write it down, so much would be absent from that. So maybe Merita has the idea that it has mm -hmm. to be visual and um, you know capture all of it the way you do it. Though. Can you do that yeah. in a little word? Do you think? I think you can. I think you know when I was using uh, oral history at that time for my masters, um, it was at that time an oral history is um, developed as well, but it was really about the, uh, the recording of the words and if you only record the words i think there's a lot that um that goes unnoticed and certainly pūrāko were not just about the words the words were part of the delivery of a pūrāko because originally it was 
awaha, we make oral, um, an oral tradition. And so when I recorded my dad's uh, story, it did come out flat. It was a very flat rendition. And I think um, had I done it, had I had the opportunity to do it again, and I could do it again, it, is that I would tell the story completely differently, that it wouldn't even start where it started in, in that rendition, which was, you know, was very, um, um, started with when did you go to school and what did you do, and sort of very logical development that actually would have started in a different place and ended in a different place. And the story was about, um, the story was about a teacher, because my dad's Maori Chinese, and uh, he went to school in uh, South Auckland. And at a time in the you know, 40s, at a time when Maori and Chinese were um, juxtaposed, if you like, in, into different groups, you know, Maori being stereotyped as one way, one thing, and Chinese both both negatively. And so this idea of being Maori Chinese was sort of irreconcilable. Mm -hmm. And so he talked about a teacher who never used his first name in his intermediate class his entire year and called him Wong. Just called him Wong for the whole year. And um, yeah, so it was a really uh, distressing story and something that he still remembers and my dad's 71 now so yeah so I but I do think there are ways of bringing those stories to life to In context yeah to to think about um, you know so it, for example how did how do names how important are names for teachers you know let's say we were talking to that audience that's that Puraka could be crafted in a way that actually provokes teachers to think more deeply than rather to say to teachers, you must use, you must pronounce my names correctly, or whatever it might be. So I think Puraka has some really um, exciting work to do in, uh, yeah, in a whole lot of spaces, in particular teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, I do thank you. Um, it's been a wonderful corridor. Um, and I think everybody that's watched will be able to take something from that, from what you've been sharing. Um, the idea that it isn't uh, something we're going to jump into straight away, that it's something that must develop. Um, I thought what I most got out of it as a researcher is just this constant need to self reflect mm -hmm. and um, look at. What you're doing, why, um, no shortcuts, all those sort of things. Um, it is challenging, um, but you do it anyway. You must do it. So that's great. Thank you. Um, I need to mention the next and final Kaipapa uh, Rangaho that's coming up. Sorry, Tika Rangaho seminar that's coming up, webinar that's coming up. And it is Tahiku uh, Kutai. Um, and she's going to be talking about data sovereignty and her discussant will be um, Mohirua. So that is the next one coming up. I don't actually have the date. Or do I? Yes, I do. 16th of October. And so please register for that. Uh, that will be the final in this series. It'll be well worth it. Um, yeah, I think that's us. Thank you, Jenny. Kapana hi nui kia koutou kua kua noho mai nei kua fakarongo mai nei ki te korero o te rā kua tukuna mai o koutou pātai. I hope that you find you're going away with a kete full of fakaro uh, that will sustain you until the next tikanga tikanga na mahau uh, webinar. Nami hi nui kia koutou. Kia ora. <laughs>